Good afternoon, financial professionals. Abby Fletcher here of E4 Insurance Services, welcoming you to The Brew, building relationships every week. Thanks for tuning in today. For those of you joining The Brew for the first time, we like to celebrate this brewcast by celebrating today's National Day for February 2nd. Today is Groundhog Day. This morning, thousands gathered around Gobbler's Knob in Puxatoni, Pennsylvania. Spoiler alert, that famous rodent did see its shadow and forecast six more weeks of winter. Groundhog Day dates back to the 1800s and is known for being a German tradition in which they used a hedgehog to predict winter and spring. When they settled in the hills of Pennsylvania, they adapted by using the groundhog. Today, check out that replay of Puxatoni Phil seeing his shadow, because although he predicts six more weeks of winter, the festivities will certainly warm your heart. Today on The Brew, we have Eric Christofferson, an estate and business attorney who is not only a friend of ours, but a highly respected resource in the estate planning community. Eric serves as practicing attorney and managing shareholder at Grams and Christofferson, which has many locations throughout greater Wisconsin. Eric's visits on the brew are a crowd favorite. So we have him reserved for 30 minutes. And this brewcast is also a two-part series titled Estate Planning Perils and Pitfalls. Eric will share real life case studies allowing financial professionals mm -hmm. to spot issues in their client's legal planning and steer them to safety. Take a look at the chat box down below. I'll be keeping a lookout for questions while Eric is live. Also, all attendees are in a drawing for a prize and we'll be announcing the winner shortly. Thanks for tuning in. And without further ado, Eric, welcome. The mic is yours. Yeah, thank you, Abby. Really appreciate you having me again and glad to be back on The Brew. And I'm always excited to talk with your esteemed financial advisors and kind of let them know what's going on in the legal world and um, always have a lot of respect for, for those professionals and what they do every day in terms of being the client's quarterback and really managing a uh, you know, very complex situation for many different families and you know, something that you know, hats off to them for, for the work that they do and staying informed and staying educated and, and you know, really helping as that uh, key, key advisor planner who often you know, is responsible for networking with the other advisors, such as the, the legal people in the plan, which you know, I uh, still do a good deal of serving in that capacity for, for many clients. And so um, one of the things that I am passionate about is helping educate financial advisors on the legal aspects. You, know, you guys are so great at what you do, but then sometimes it's you know, help me know where my blind spots are with my client's legal planning so that I know when I see this issue, that's a problem or that's something that I need to have further conversation on or open the door to, okay, is there is there some opportunities or threats there relative to the particular client situation? So um, what I put together in that regard is uh, a presentation that, um, you know, I've given many uh, continuing education, uh, educational type presentations to financial advisors. And one of the things I consistently get positive um, feedback on is the actual case studies where they say, you know what, it's really helpful to hear some cases that actually unfolded, what happened, what went wrong, what could have been done to prevent that, because oftentimes, you know, you learn better from that than, you know, through textbook learning of, you know, these are the different these are the different points to look out for. It's like, well, tell me a, tell me a real story where this happened and, and let's uh, kind of delve through that. So that's what I'm gonna do today is I do have three case studies prepared of actual client matters that I've worked on. Of course, um, you know, confidentially won't be sharing any names or anything like that, but giving you the general overview of actual situations that have happened. So um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, dive right into that. Now, um, there's just a little sheet on my bio. Again, you know, more than happy to network with financial advisors. Specifically, um, we're licensed in Wisconsin, so we're very helpful with any Wisconsin legal matters that should come up. And you know, not here to to toot my own horn, but you know, 
again, we're, we're generally very well regarded as trust and estate specialists, especially here in Dane County, where we have five offices and, you know, any, any uh, reach out from financial advisors is always welcome because, you know, we're, we're more than happy to collaborate with you and, um, you know, bring some legal perspective into a situation if it's needed. Um, and I'm always happy to do a uh, initial consult off the record, no charge with any financial professional who just wants a uh, legal set of eyes on a problem and wants to know where they should go with it. So always offer that opportunity to any, any of my attendees. Um, but yeah, no, no um, need to bore you guys with the rest of this. Certainly, I, I can get very excited talking about myself and the great team of individuals that work with me, but we won't be doing that today. <laughs> Spare you that. But uh, what we will talk about today is our estate planning perils and pitfalls. So as uh, Abby mentioned, this will be a two-part series. And today, um, just in terms of organizing the topics, um, Today's topics are related to what I'm calling marital mishaps and single slip ups. Basically, these are issues that one component of the issue, at least, is the client's marital status, whether that was they were married and that caused issues or whether it was they were not married and that caused issues. And kind of just talking about what are the different issues that can arise in planning based on a client's marital status and what are the different um, workarounds for those or things to be aware of. So that's that's what we're talking about today is those uh, planning perils and pitfalls. So um, I chuckled at that uh, that picture there. So if you've seen my presentations before too, I like to I like to use funny images or a lot of times um, pop culture references. I'm a big movie buff and TV buff, so anything like that, you know, you'll usually see a few of those thrown in. So be warned. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next slide here we have is is one of those references here. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. So <laughs> as I said, names have been changed for confidentiality purposes, but it just always reminds me of that, uh, that uh, dragnet slogan. So um, of course, you know, we're, we're very protective of client confidentiality, but at the same time, we do want to share these situations in a generic manner to help educate other financial professionals because there is, you know, real value in, in learning from those experiences and, and so forth. So, so that's what we'll do today. And of course, you know, another disclaimer that I always give is no, nothing that I'm giving today is legal advice and any um, legal advice has to be uh, separately administered directly based on a personal client situation. These are just examples. So, um, so in Wisconsin, we have something called marital property, which is more generically called community property. And so um, the idea behind this is that um, during a marriage, any assets that are acquired or earned are generally considered shared by the married couple. And so um, it's a more complex legal system than the alternative, which is what they call common law property which common law property is based on titling, meaning if you have an account as an individual, it's an individual. If you have an account as joint, it's joint. That's very simple, very straightforward. Marital property though, throws a wrench in all of that and basically says, we don't care how your account is titled. It's going to be based on um, when those contributions occurred, did they occur during the marriage? And it results in, like I said, a lot of complex accounting in the event of a divorce, separation, estate settlement, any of those scenarios where you're actually having to split up an account um, makes it a lot more complicated because it's not something as easy as just go by the titling and distribute it um, based on the beneficiaries. So that's something that any uh, clients you're dealing with in community property states, which Wisconsin is one of them, is uh, very critical to understand that concept that you can't just go by the account titling and that there's these phantom non-title rights that spouses have um, via the community property. So um, uh, state-wise, about 50% of the population of the United States is under community property jurisdictions, even though uh, a good majority of the states are still common law jurisdictions, but, you know, California, for example, is community property. So there's some, some larger states that um, bring, bring up the averages population-wise. But regardless, uh, very good to always determine what is your client's state of residence and do they fall under this sort of community property system, because it's really going to throw a wrench into 
their perceived planning as far as did they did they view any of these items as shared. Um, the other thing that did come up fairly recently in the law is um, with gay marriage now being legal in all 50 states via Supreme Court decision, anyone who was previously married um, in states that did not recognize that uh, relationship legally, now constitutionally that's recognized everywhere. So all of those people are now legally married for all federal law purposes, whether they realize that or not, that kind of came in and threw a wrench in their system. So that's one thing to, um, to realize if you're working with gay and lesbian clients is that it's very important um, also that you determine their marital status because now, basically now there is no difference but they've been operating under their lifetimes that there was a difference because up until recently that um, they were having to operate, unfortunately, under a different system. Now we're all operating under the same system, but um, that might have not been their expectation. They might have still been expecting that they were doing their own thing as they were previously. So something to be aware of, just a side note on that as it pertains to community property is that this applies to all marriages. Um, then the first case study that I have for you here is a really interesting scenario we had with a blended family. And so um, obviously blended family is becoming more and more common and uh, people are getting married at older ages. That's what happened in this particular case is the older gentleman who had a family farm in his family for multiple generations. Um, his wife had passed on and he had three boys. They're gonna you know, inherit and work the farm once he was gone. And um, he did get remarried to a, a nice a nice older lady and the, the, the two of them got together and um, intended to not mix their estates, you know, intended to keep things separate, but um, that wasn't well communicated in the planning they did. And in fact, as part of standard trust planning, as it often is, they signed a marital property agreement, which um, stated actually that they were opting into the standard marital property system, which is that property is all marital. Obviously, that was not their intent. But again, it's, it's a matter of um, when you sign a legal document, <laughs> whether you understood it or not, there's there can be issues that arise. So um, essentially, they signed a marital property agreement that did state that they're that their assets were marital property, which again, that wasn't an issue as long as uh, both of them were alive, no problem whatsoever, because they continued to operate as they normally did. He did his thing on the farm with his boys and, and so forth. But um, ultimately what ended up happening though, is that she passed away, um, his new wife passed away. And so then her children were actually settling her estate. And as part of her estate, they made the determination that based on that marital property agreement, she actually owned half of all of his assets. And so essentially um, they went back after this family farm and said, hey, this is a $5 million farm and we want a two and a half million dollar buyout and you have to pay us this cash over. And um, you know, certainly you can imagine how the boys responded to that and the dad responded to that. This is an extremely stressful situation for them. It's not what any of them intended. And um, oftentimes this stuff will go into dispute resolution or mediation or sometimes litigation to resolve some of these issues. Um, but ultimately uh, we were able to negotiate a favorable settlement and allow the, the husband to keep the farm. And, um, but again, it never, never feels good when you have to, in a sense, buy someone's legal claim off um, when that claim could have been properly protected with proper legal planning on the front end. So, um, so the big, the big uh, takeaway from this is when you are doing um, second marriage planning, you absolutely have to have a conversation about what is the intent of the parties as far as how they hold their assets? Because like I said, you can't just go by titling and say, oh, the titling was all separate. Um, and so it stays separate. The issue with that is um, in Wisconsin, as well as other community property jurisdictions, if those assets make any earnings during the marriage, so like if a farm produces um, crops or rent, um, or if your investment account makes earnings, all of those things, even if the asset was individual, all those earnings are considered marital during the pendency of a marital relationship. 
So there's all these issues with commingling, as we call it, that um, lay people just don't even think about, um, but they can cause huge legal wrenches in your plan. So, um, so whenever you're dealing with a Brady Bunch type family, you know, it looks all, it looks great on TV, but uh, when the rubber meets the road, especially when you're dealing with older couples where it wasn't actually the Brady Bunch where you got together when all the kids were young and really made one family together. And it was adult children who are 40, 50 years old when their parents are getting remarried. Well, that's a whole different scenario where they may be very cordial with their step parent, but it's not gonna be the same type of situation. So um, this is just a few statistics on blended families and how common they are now um, in our planning and how you really do need to be prepared to plan for these scenarios is that um, 1300 new step families are formed each day and 40% of families now in the United States actually are blended families with at least one partner having a child from a prior relationship. So um, it's something that you are all going to encounter in your uh, planning with clients. And it is a very sensitive topic. And um, generally my advice is to open-endedly ask the client to describe the situation and how they perceive it. And, and that's generally the best way before you start even trying to advise on which way they should or shouldn't go is just open it up to them to kind of explain to them, um, you know, how they view it. Do we view it as our children? Do we view it as his kids and her kids? And kind of let them explain how that relationship developed, how it formed. So this is more of obviously the, the psychology side of things, but it's very important to um, before you jump into saying, hey, well, this is legally how this would work, or this is financially how this would work, you know, definitely understand the client's goals and how they want it to work. Because again, usually we can make it work the way they want it to work, but we need to know what they want. That's, I think, the biggest pitfall in blended families is because of the difficulty sometimes of having these conversations, they haven't had conversations on what he wants, what she wants, how is it supposed to, how is it supposed to go down if they um, envisioned the way things would work. And um, sometimes you're the one that is having that conversation with them for the first time. Um, so it's, it's very important that that be addressed. So uh, this is kind of the, the end catch all of, well, how do I, how do I protect an inheritance if I'm living in a community property state? Well, um, as we said in that example, rather than having an opt-in marital agreement, which says I want to be part of the marital property system, you actually can opt out of the marital property system and say, I don't wanna be a part of that, but that does require a written contract between the parties that says we don't wanna be part of that. And we do want to be treated more like a common law community, excuse me, more like a common law state where they don't have community property. And we want to have our titling control things and keep it simple in that regard. You know, parties are perfectly able to enter into that type of agreement, but they actually need to do that. It needs to be a legal contract. Otherwise there's all these quasi property rights not written that are just floating around out there causing problems. So um, the other thing which is generally just never done, but is available at law is I talked about how the, the income, the profits, the rents, everything associated with the property, you can unilaterally declare that to be individual property. But uh, the, kind of the joke of this is you have to send your spouse a certified letter on an annual basis declaring that property to be your individual property, unilaterally making that declaration. And so you can imagine why people don't do this because uh, obviously won't go very well for their marital relationships to be delivering that letter on an annual basis. <laughs> so um, it's just generally not seen. It's something that's written into the law, but is more theoretical. Um, and so again, we prefer to say, let's do it, knock it out once with a marital property agreement and never have to do it again or else um, this last option on here, creating a inheritance trust for your children, you can actually have it so that when you leave an inheritance to the next generation, they never have to deal with any of this marital property type issues with their spouse if you leave it to the next generation in a trust 
that is properly drafted, that trust will always remain the separate individual property of the recipient, and it never has to have any of these interferences. So that's generally the best way to do it is solve it at the prior generation by doing a trust. If you're not able to have had that done, then a marital property agreement at the recipient generation will solve the problem. Um, the other options are generally not the greatest, though, because in terms of actually not commingling funds and issuing unilateral statements, those are generally um, not able to be uh, well carried out by the, the people who would have to do it. So, so that, that's the big thing here is trust planning is fantastic to protect against all these quasi-community property rights, and then marital property agreements are another fantastic way to um, keep things clean. So, um, and then last one there, <laughs> I, I say this jokingly, but also not jokingly. Sometimes my advice to clients, especially later in life, is just don't get married because certainly you can get married and then hire me to do a bunch of complex legal planning. But one of the other things you can certainly do to avoid the need for complex legal planning is to simply not be married because then you will not fall under all those marital property laws. However, as we'll talk about in the final segment here, not being married also leads to its own perils and pitfalls. So that's where, again, you want to very consciously make a decision about your marital status and then understand and know how that affects your property rights. So um, <laughs> little joke slide here um, about uh, keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut afterwards. So I'm sure if any of you guys are married, you can relate to that at least to some degree. Um, and so this next study then is on uh, non-marital partners. So um, the I got a couple quick examples on this. These are a little more straightforward, but what um, situation I uh, had just recently dealt with this past year is I had a nice gentleman, relatively young, um, unfortunately lost his, his wife, um, prematurely to, to cancer. And um, basically they, and I use the term wife, they were not married. They were together for 15 years, long-term partners. Everyone who knew them thought they were married because they called each other husband and wife even, but they never were legally married. So that that's um, important too. When you ask if someone's married, I always use the term, are you legally married? Um, because again, some people consider themselves partners or spouses and just don't um, feel the need to avail themselves of the state and uh, the state's sanctioning of that. So um, legal marriage obviously is important because in Wisconsin, we do not have any kind of um, common law marriage where it says, oh, if you were together for a certain number of years, you're automatically married. That is abolished in Wisconsin. Other, other jurisdictions obviously are on a state-by-state -state basis, and you'd have to determine based on your state whether that was something that could be argued. But um, in Wisconsin, it's not. It's a, a foreclosed issue that if you are not married, you do not have any marital rights. And so um, in the case I'm dealing with, um, you know, this is an interesting one because I think it's very typical of what you see with non-marital partners. So the, the, the lady who died, she had left her husband as beneficiary on substantially all her assets, which was a great job of her doing that because he didn't have any default property rights. But as long as he's a beneficiary, that takes care of things just fine. Well, it turns out she had done a great job of listing him on life insurance and qualified investments, but essentially had neglected to name him on the non-qualified investments and was just unaware that the beneficiaries she filled out did not also um, cover those non-qualified assets. And um, so what ended up happening is her mother, who was actually in a nursing home, um, ended up being the inheritor of all of her assets. And because the mom's in a nursing home, then that obviously caused a lot of problems legally with, um, with her inheriting those assets because your parents are actually your heirs at law if you are not legally married. So uh, that's one thing that people sometimes don't realize is if, if you die and um, aren't in a, uh, don't have children and don't have a spouse, um, a legal spouse, then your assets go to your parents. And so that's what happened in this case. And then even the worst part was we came to find out that they, the home that they own together um, is in both of their names. But again, when you're not married, you actually have to put special language on the deed that says joint with rights of survivorship. And again, in this particular case, we came to find out that they did not do that. 
and they did have both their names on the title, which is again, what the lay person thinks of is, oh, well, are both our names are on the title? Okay, they're both on the title, we're fine. Well, again, because they're not married and they didn't use this special joint language, again, it turned out that half of his house went to her mother who's in the nursing home. So he only owns half of his home and has to buy out the nursing home in a sense and the wife, or the, the wife's mother who's in the nursing home and had to buy out her half share of the house. So just again, just these situations that people do not think of um, and um, really important to, to realize and, and kind of this, this third case study here, which is very similar to what I just described it as another additional twist um, you know, reiterating this issue that proper estate planning for non-marital couples is critical because they don't have these default property rights. And then um, this third case study with the non-marital partners, um, again, this one was a much older couple and the wife was actually in the nursing home and I was working with the husband and the wife passed away, you know, passed away in the nursing home after having lived there for a couple of years. And uh, situation here was very similar in that even though it was his house, um, she who was in the nursing home owned half of the house. And so Medicaid took a lien against the property for her, for her um, care that they provided, put a lien against the house. And in a typical marital situation, Medicaid does not collect on that lien until the second spouse dies. But again, if you remember, this situation is a non-marital couple. Again, these people had been together for 50 years, just didn't feel the need to get married. And so because they weren't legally married, he has no spousal rights under the Medicaid law. And so basically, Medicaid takes a lien against her half of the house, and then he's got to pay off that Medicaid lien. Um, immediately. He doesn't get to defer it till the second death because he's not a spouse and doesn't get that right to do that. So um, we were actually able to positively negotiate with Medicaid and, uh, you know, agree to a settlement where they would defer, but that is was not his legal rights to have that happen. You know, legally, he would have had to sell his house and pay off the lien, again, just because they weren't married. So, um, you know, kind of the the really critical thing is, you know, and, and we, we do a lot of what we call elder law too, but in the context of any elder planning, non-marital partners lose those spousal protections or, or more accurately, never had them in the first place, even though they may perceive that they have spousal protections, stuff such as when your spouse goes in the nursing home, you're able to receive a spouse allowance up to one half of $250,000. And so... Um, that's eligible for, again, married partners, but for non-marital partners, they're just not eligible for that because they're not legally married. So, so there's all these little nuances of, okay, marriage can cause issues relative to marital property, but also at the same time, marriage can be beneficial when it comes to default property rights for title ownership as well as um, elder planning. So it's a double-edged sword where um, you really need to know the pros and cons of are you legally married and how does that affect your situation? So it sounds like a simple thing, but something that, um, again, unless you're dealing with a traditional family of long-term married couple with mutual children from that same relationship, um, and again, as you saw statistically, that's less than, you know, 60, you know, can't be more than 60% of people based on that statistic that says 40% are blended families. And certainly some are just not, um, you know, simpler structures, but that aside, 40% um, of your clients, you're going to have to determine what, you know, is their stepchildren, what's the marital status, you know, and, and all of those sorts of things. So um, it's a much more important legal issue than sometimes gets addressed because there's all kinds of implications that flow downhill from, you um, what that what that status is as far as what's the family status and what's the marital status, all those things. So little parting quote here from the comedian, Henny Youngman says, the secret to a happy marriage remains a secret. So <laughs> uh, another uh, little, little humor there for you. Um, and so I'm gonna take some questions here in a bit if there are any, um, otherwise really appreciated your time today, appreciated you listening to some of these planning and pitfalls based off of um, marital status, not being married, being married, 
how that can affect things. And uh, looking forward to next time talking with you about another set of perils and pitfalls. This next one is gonna talk about beneficiary blunders, which um, what that's gonna be about is mistakes made with beneficiary designations. So that in particular will be very relevant to financial advisors because oftentimes you're the ones who are filling out the beneficiary designations with the client, or at least talking to them about their beneficiary designations. Um, and then the family feuds that can arise from those non-traditional families or from situations where maybe um, someone exerted influence over someone else to name beneficiaries in a certain way and the issues that that can cause legally. So that's what I will look forward to talking with you about next time. And um, I, I guess at this point, I'll open it up, Abby, if there's any any questions or feedback, you know, certainly happy to uh, uh, open up the floor. Yes, thank you, Eric. And, and some questions have bubbled up in the chat box. But before I start with those, uh, the line is open. So if any of the audience has any questions, get them ready. So Eric, first question, uh, does an inheritance protection trust require pre or post nuptial agreements? Also, how often are these agreements challenged? Great question. So um, if you do an inheritance protection trust, then it does not require a pre or post nuptial agreement. So that's the, the huge advantage to having that set up in the first place is you don't need the spouse's consent. The idea behind that is the elders who created this trust, it's their property. And so they're able to leave it in whatever manner they choose. And if they choose to leave it in a manner that is protected and is just to their son or daughter and not to their in-law, the law respects their right to do that so long as they set it up properly legally and the, the son or daughter does not need to enter into a marital agreement with the, with the in-law. Um, so it avoids them having to do that. As far as how often marital agreements are challenged, um, I would say that that's typically handled at a negotiation phase as opposed to actually legally challenging the contract in court. Um, but one of the things that is fairly common in negotiating on marital property agreements is they look at, was there any pressure on the spouse? Meaning, did they act under duress when they entered into this agreement? And were they fully informed about the situation? when they entered into this agreement. So a lot of, again, lay people kind of have the idea of, oh, well, I got their signature on that document, which is a contract, you know, a marital agreement is a contract between two parties. So all general contract law principles will apply to it. Um, the idea being is, oh, well, I just, the night before the wedding had her sign this agreement that said, I will keep all my property as mine individually. Well, again, that would, that would, fail largely on both of those tests that she was under duress, that she it was the night before she didn't have a choice. She wasn't able to consult with her own legal counsel about the implications of the agreement. I probably did not give her a full disclosure and memorandum of all my assets when I asked her to do that. Um, and so that's something that if if this process is done professionally, does require two attorneys, one representing each spouse, and it does require a full disclosure of assets, which means that just like where if you're applying for a bank loan and you have to list all assets and liabilities, you have to disclose to your spouse all assets and liabilities so that they can say that they entered into that with full knowledge of the rights that they were giving up and they were legally advised by their own counsel as to what those rights were. If you go through that full robust process, generally your agreement will be more bulletproof. Obviously, as, as you may know from attorneys, not, nothing is ever bulletproof, but we wanna mitigate as much risk as possible. And if you do that, you'll be, you'll be a, a very long way towards having an agreement that is, that is unchallengeable. Um, it, agreements have to also be generally fair and equitable when they were entered into as well as when they were implemented. And that's kind of the catch-all that attorneys will use to be able to fight about anything, even if it was <laughs> done properly. But, um, but I will say that most oftentimes the, the attacks are made just on the basis of someone not following proper procedures. And that's low-hanging fruit that's easy for attorneys to go after. So, Thanks. Great, great response, Eric. 
Um, that brought up some more questions. So this <laughs> coming from Dan, Dan Peterson, the president of E4. Eric, in a non-community property state, isn't there a concept of marital share, i.e. a minimum by statute to a spouse? Yes, um, th that's a good point. And so there are still certain rights in, in, in non-community property states. So I didn't want to imply that there are no spousal rights in common law states. Now, again, your mileage is going to vary greatly but, but depending on what state the jurisdiction is. And so if you do run into an issue like that, you're going to have to consult with a local attorney licensed in that state. Now, in terms of elective share and that stuff, a lot of that traditionally was done through the probate estate. And so um, this is where, um, as you know, as advisors, assets can be set up probate and non-probate. And oftentimes the laws on elective share and those sorts of things are done through the probate court. And so it can get very complicated and fighting about is an asset inside the court estate? Is it outside the court estate and passing directly? Um, and then on, as you may know too, on some of those assets that do pass directly outside of court, if you're naming someone other than um, a spousal beneficiary, especially like on employer-sponsored retirement plans and those sorts of things, your spouse does actually have to sign a waiver on that beneficiary form, um, agreeing to have someone else be named. So there, there's still, um, even in common law states, there's still a, a patchwork of laws that are going to protect spouses. It's just they're not, they're, the protections are not as robust and thorough as what you'll see in a community property state. But it is much more clear where, where you, can, you can do stuff more based on titling and be more certain that your titling is actually going to be accurate. Um, and that's, that's what clients perceive. Clients perceive that their titling is paramount and it's always news to them when you explain to them that it's not um, in a community property jurisdiction. So. Thank you. Good one, good one. Thanks for the question, Dan. And that concludes the questions from the chat box. A flurry of compliments though, Eric. So oh, everybody really you. enjoyed your presentation and, and great information. Now let's go to the drawing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna have you draw a number between one and 34, Eric. All right, um, I because it's um, I was telling Abby, I totally didn't even know it was Groundhog Day today. So I found out uh, we're getting six more weeks of winter, which is sad to hear being in Wisconsin. <laughs> but um, since it is uh, 2 2 22, I'm going to go with number 22. Good one. Good one. Who's the winner? Who's the winner? Brian Avery, congrats, sir. Be on the lookout for a coffee card and some complimentary CE coming your way from all of us here at E4. Thanks for coming in. Also, be sure to tune in next Wednesday because we'll have part two of estate planning perils and pitfalls. This is one you won't want to miss. Thanks for tuning in and happy Groundhog's Day. Uh, thanks, everyone. Appreciated you having me and look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks, Eric. Very much, Eric.